Hello and welcome to the Soul Sync Podcast. I'm Jason Paul. If you're new to the podcast, a big welcome to you. And if you're returning, welcome back to the Soul Sync family. Today, it's just you and me on this episode because I'm going to take you on a deep dive into a topic that's not just been a part of my journey, but honestly has become a guiding force in my life. And that is the law of attraction. Now picture this, a young ambitious lad washing dishes at 16, barely a GCSE to his name, living in a deprived part of London, that was me. But in the midst of the suds and soapy water, I had a dream, a dream of soaring through the skies, working as cabin crew for Virgin Atlantic. Little did I know at that time, I was unknowingly dabbling in the magic of the law of attraction. Now fast forward to my 18th birthday, fresh from a family holiday to Orlando, the seed of desire firmly planted. I wanted to wear that Virgin Atlantic uniform, live my best life and travel the world. Now I used the power of visualization and the universe literally heard. I applied for the job with all my heart and soul and got it. As I navigated my way through Heathrow, flying all over the world, it wasn't just a daydream. It was a force I was tapping into without even knowing. But life took a massive turn. I left Virgin, joined the Metropolitan Police Force, and I faced abuse, bullying, and found myself literally at rock bottom. That's when the secret resurfaced in my life. Desperate for change, I religiously practiced the law of attraction, manifesting a journey from despair to building a multi-million pound company. Now it's quite the story and today I'm going to share some of the twists and turns, the battles with self-confidence, substance abuse and the near collapse of everything. We'll explore the power of self-limiting beliefs and the importance of gratitude. So get ready to join me on this journey as we go through some of the highs and lows of my life and the law of attraction. Enjoy. Now, thank you for joining me on this Law of Attraction episode. So I'm going to talk about all aspects of the Law of Attraction and some of the big uh, bits of advice I can give you on your journey. And also some of the big things uh, that I think trip us up when we're trying to manifest. I know this because I still at times struggle to manifest uh, some things myself. Sometimes it can come down to a self-limiting belief or something that I just need to work on as a person. So You might be very new to the law of attraction. This might even be the first you've ever heard of it on this episode, but that's absolutely fine. You might have perhaps just read the book, The Secret. Um, You might have watched the movie. You might be a seasoned manifester, or maybe you're just curious. But the good thing is through this episode, I'm going to talk about all aspects of the law of attraction, and I will give you my top tips on how I think it can help you. But I want to tell you about my backstory because the law of attraction really is woven into my backstory And I think by telling you the story, it will allow you to kind of see how I've managed to use the law of attraction myself. I think when a lot of other podcasts that I've listened to have talked about the law of attraction, sometimes I think it's very much glamorized. And I think it's very important to really show some of the not so good bits to show how the law of attraction was used um, against that and for the purposes of good. So I give you um, the kind of warning now. I'm going to go into all kind of aspects and lots of twists and turns of my journey here. But I hope that you find this really useful. Now, just before we go into my backstory, first of all, what is the law of attraction? Now, the law of attraction, it's not some mystical concept. It's a powerful force that shapes our lives in ways we might not always realise. At its core, the law of attraction is like a cosmic magnet, pulling into our lives whatever we consistently think about and focus on. In simpler terms, it's the idea that like attracts like. Positive thoughts attract positive experiences, while negative thoughts attract, well, you've guessed it, the not so great stuff. Think of it as like ordering from the cosmic menu. If you're sending out vibes of success, abundance and positivity, the universe takes note and starts delivering those things right to your doorstep. On the flip side, if you're stuck in a negative thought loop, guess what? The universe might serve up a dish that you'd rather not have. Now, the law of attraction isn't just a one-time thing. It is a constant dance. It's about maintaining a positive mindset and being intentional about what you'd want to attract into your life. It's not about wishful thinking alone. It's about aligning your thoughts, feelings and your actions with your desires. 
So here's the deal, whether you're seeking love, success, or just a better vibe in your life, the law of attraction is like your cosmic ally. It's not about magically wishing things into existence. It's about consciously creating the energy you want to attract. So how did I first come across the law of attraction? So as I mentioned um, a bit in the show intro, I grew up in West London. I grew up um, with my mum and my mum had me from a very young age when she was 18 years old. And I went to a school. I didn't realise it at the time. Um, I actually only realised it really recently. I went to one of the bottom three secondary schools in the country and it was in a BBC interview that I did recently, but I come to realise that the researcher pulled it out and I said, wow, you know, the school was bad, but I didn't realise it was in the bottom three schools. So my experience of schooling um, wasn't great. I didn't have a great time in school. I was bullied a lot and I went to an all boys school and I was bullied a lot for being gay. At the time, I didn't even know if I really was gay, um, but I think that's probably what made it harder for me um, in my later teenage years to fully accept that because there was a lot of trauma there from that period of my life. Anyway, when I left school, my first job was washing up dishes in a restaurant. And I did that at 16 years old in a Frankie and Benny's restaurant. To anyone who knows what Frankie and Benny's is in the uh, England, of course. And it was around the time when I was 18 years old. So when I first came across the law of attraction... I think I was practicing it before I even consciously knew what it was. So I'd been quite into performing magic alongside working in this restaurant, washing up dishes. So at the weekends, I would perform magic and um, I used to really enjoy that. And then during the week, I'd wash up dishes in the restaurant. However, I'd been about 18 years old, just or just about to turn 18 years old. I'd been on a family holiday to Orlando And I'd flown on the airline Virgin Atlantic and I looked at those cabin crew and I thought, wow, I want to do that job. I want to fly all over the world. So one of the first things I did when I got back was I went onto their website and saw that you had to be 18 years old to work at Virgin Atlantic. And I was just about to turn 18. So you guessed it. On my 18th birthday, I started filling out the application form. It must have taken me hours and hours and hours and I must have got my mum to read it back again and again and again. And then I sent the application off and I would literally daydream about travelling around the world wearing the uniform like those crew looked like they were living their best life and I absolutely wanted it. So I literally put my heart and soul into it and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. The day then came that a letter arrived and I'd been invited to an interview. So I went for the interview. I was super nervous. I ended up getting to the interview in a trading estate. It must have been two hours early, uh, walking around, pacing around. But the whole time I was uh, literally daydreaming about getting that job. When I arrived at the interview in the room, there was about 30 people and I was by far the youngest. As they went around the room, everyone introducing themselves. I remember sitting there thinking, um, I, you know, this is crazy. Everyone else has had lots of jobs and then they get to me and I say, what, what they said to me, what do you do? And I said, well, I wash up dishes, but perform magic. Anyway, throughout the course of the morning, the group got smaller and smaller as people were whittled down and it got down to two of us and um, me and this lovely lady, Michelle. And then the ladies invited us in for the, the proper full interview. And they said to me, um, what is it that you do? And I talked through my passion for magic and they asked if they could see a trick. Now, believe it or not, I wasn't actually super prepared at bringing something, but I did have a pack of cards in my pocket and I performed a trick. They seemed to really like it. And then that was it. Away we went. Um, And we were told that we would hear back within two weeks in writing. Now, during that time, to say I must have been visualising myself in that virgin uniform is an understatement. It was all I could think about. Now, I know now, looking back at this, I manifested that by so strongly believing, by so strongly feeling. Um, I didn't just imagine myself. I would feel the emotions and the feelings of elevation and joy of me wearing that uniform. So the day came that the letter arrived. I opened it and that was the start of my adventure working for Virgin Atlantic. So to fast forward a few months on, I'd done my training at Virgin and I was on a flight to New York and we used to get a little bit of a break sometimes on the plane, uh, believe it or not. It was really busy. uh, So there'd be a few of us crew serving up a few hundred passengers 
And there was a cabin crew member that I just met because before every flight, you'd fly with a different set of crew. There were thousands of different crew members. And a lady was reading a book and it looked really interesting. It looked like quite an old book, but it was still quite a modern book in a way, if that makes sense. And I asked her what it was. And she said, but this is the secret. It's about how to effectively get anything you want in life. She explained the basic concept to me and I was really interested, wrote the name of it down. And when I landed into New York and I went shopping, I picked up a copy of the book. And I remember now distinctly back then sitting in the bath and reading this book. And I probably did practice it then for a good, good few weeks. But I was a young guy living my best life. I read it and then I kind of put it down and forgot about it. Now, this is when the story starts going um, a bit south and a bit sour. So let's talk about the next chapter. So I must have been about two and a half years into working for Virgin Atlantic when I decided that I was going to become um, a police officer. Basically, the Metropolitan Police at the time were recruiting for the Olympics. And I thought to myself, I do need to get a proper job at some point. Also, as much as I love flying all around um, the world, it was starting to take an impact on me with jet lag. I've always been, um, well, since about 10 years old, I've been diabetic and the honestly, the time differences and trying to get insulin at the right time. Back then, uh, it wasn't these sophisticated pumps that we have now. It was making sure that you do certain types of insulin at certain times of the day. So it just wasn't working for me um, flying around the world constantly um, every single week. So I applied to the Metropolitan Police and uh, to cut a bit of a long story short there, I got the job. And I then um, proceeded to start my six months um, training at the Metropolitan Police's training centre. And and after the six months training, I was posted out to Borough as a response PC. Um, so my job was to answer 999 calls. Um, pretty early on into my time working as a police officer... I started to have a really bad time in the police and th that was mainly because one of the sergeants I worked for um, started to effectively make my life very difficult, which I think all stemmed from the fact um, ultimately that I was gay. And I think the difficult thing about that situation was I'd kind of learned a virgin to really embrace my sexuality and Virgin was so encouraging about that kind of thing. Honestly, if if you was a straight or heterosexual man, you was in the minority of Virgin. Um, you were the odd one out. And um, <clears throat> so it's around this sort of time as well that I started um, to get into um, a relationship. And the, uh, let me explain a bit about that. So I originally met um, a chap, we'll, we'll call him Daniel, and we met online and we'd everything was going really well at the start and this was around the time that I just started in the police um sort of being out there as an actual police officer policing the streets of London and when we first met online um he told me that he was 19 years old I was about 22 maybe coming on 23 a few weeks into the relationship um every, everything was going well but it became apparent that actually he was 17 rather than 19 and then me being young and naive completely understood the reasons why I'd done it um I think the reasons were because he felt that he was more mature or whatever uh that might have been so we very quickly and obviously this is the benefit of hindsight uh moved in together I just bought um a flat or an apartment in London and it was it literally stretched me beyond belief. It left me with absolutely barely any money at all at the end of the month. And it was, um, but he moved in. And at the time, um, you know, I, I we was obviously having a good time in the relationship. And obviously I thought it would help with um, bills as well. So it all seemed to make sense, it seemed to make perfect sense. So as the months progressed, the bullying um, in the police got worse and worse and worse. And uh, it started off as light sort of remarks about my dress. And um, it then started to really take a whole new dimension whereby I was actually really scared of the sergeant that I worked for. And at that time, I saw things in the police as well that I just wasn't comfortable with. Things that um, I felt some of the actions of this sergeant were 
um, not in line with the law and not what you would expect from a police officer. And I also started to notice there was an undercurrent in the police of discrimination. Um, you know, if a, a victim of crime didn't speak English, the way that it'd be dealt with just wasn't right. And what I started to feel was the reasons why I joined the police was ultimately to help people. And um, I was really passionate about that. And and when you start to see things inside of the police that don't align with what they're meant to be protecting, it was very difficult. So I remember one distinct evening um, when I was a police officer, when me and uh, the sergeant got paired out together on patrol because um, the sergeant would choose the postings for the evening. And I used to dread um, when we'd sit in the parade room and at the start of a shift, we'd get told what our assignment was for the night. So you'd, you, who you were paired with. And I used to always think, please, please, please don't put us together because I knew it would just be the night shift of hell. Anyway, in the early hours of the morning of that night shift, the sergeant proceeded to tell me, and this is, I think, quite a pivotal point of the story, really, that as a police officer, if you need to report a crime... Uh, you report it directly to him um, because he's your line manager. And if there's crime, you report it to a line manager, which, uh, but he did say there was a caveat. If it was an emergency, then obviously you could dial 999. Now, looking back, that's an absolute load of rubbish. That was never the case, but it was used um, to coercively control me. What happened with this sergeant then was he went on to um, sexually assault me on three different occasions. Once was at a Christmas party and two times were in a police vehicle when we was posted out on um, patrol together. Now, whilst this was going on, things at home were far from rosy. The relationship um, with Daniel had started to turn very, very sour. Uh, it started off with him checking my phone and that then progressed to him just being very coercively controlling over me to the point where I was actually really scared of him because he was really irrational and I felt I'd got myself into an awful situation. I was suffering quite simply from domestic abuse at home from Daniel and there'd be times where he would lie on the bonnet of my car to prevent me from going to work or would say, I'm going to turn up at the police station and tell your sergeant um, that you've hit me. And it was awful. I confided in my mum and said, look, this is happening and I need to get out of this relationship. So she said, what we'll do is we'll call um, his parents and get him to and get them to come down. So they turned up one evening and they could see he'd locked himself in the bathroom and it was a right scene and we pleaded with them to um, take take him back um, because I, I couldn't go on living like this and it was creating so much fear. So they didn't take him back. And it, what I felt at the time was all, it was almost an undercurrent that they didn't really care that much. Um, so what I probably should have done in hindsight, well, I should have definitely done in hindsight, was reported this to the police. But I, the reason I couldn't report it to the police was because I was told that the only person I could report it to was the line manager. And there was no way in the world I was going to mention it to this particular sergeant. So I would go to work with the fear of, of God in the police of what would happen next in regards to this sergeant. But then I would come home to the abuse from Daniel and I was really in a low place. So it got to a point um, a few months later where I did finally manage to break up with Daniel. And I initially thought that obviously he would move immediately back to the area where he was from, which was quite far from where I actually lived. It was a good hour and a half drive. However, he didn't move back to the area uh, where he grew up. He decided to uh, find a room share, literally a five minute walk from where I was living. So even though he wasn't, we weren't in a relationship and he wasn't out of my life, I was really scared um, of what he was going to do. He would call me all the time, demand to see me, even if we weren't in a relationship. And one of the police officers I was working with, who was a friend of mine, she was a lovely um, female police officer. She could see how stressed I was. And she said to me, Jason, um, come on holiday. Let's go to Spain for a few days. And 
we arrived at Gatwick Airport and my phone was ringing constantly, constantly, constantly from him, demanding to speak to me. Um, he'd got wind that I was going away. And when we arrived in Spain, silence, complete silence. He didn't contact me. And that in itself was unnerving me more than the constant bombardment, of course, because I couldn't wrap my head around why he suddenly went silent. Anyway, I had a few days in Spain and I got back. And about a week and a half, two weeks after I got back, and I didn't hear from him this whole period of being back from a week and a half. It was literally silence, which was unnerving me. But after about a week, I started to ease into it and thought to myself, OK, maybe he is getting over this. Maybe he is moving on. And I started to relax a bit more. All the while longer, I was still having the issues at work. Um, but at least I could come back to some level of solitude um, at my house. I was due to get my um, certificate in the police, which is when you pass your probation period, which isn't easy. You have to demonstrate a lot of different attributes and you have to go through um, a whole load of evidence you have to demonstrate in order to pass your probation. So it's quite a uh, prestigious moment. So you get invited to meet the head of the borough, the top, top police officer in your borough, and you wear your tunic, which is the really smart police officer outfit, and you polish your shoes, and, you know, it's a big thing that you go over there. So I was due to go over there with another police officer who was in my team who we'd um, done a lot of the training together. So I had my best shoes on, um, I had my tunic on, and I was all ready to go um, over to the police station. So we get there and she gets led in to meet the borough commander first and then I was going to be second. I then get called and um, jump up ready to go meet the borough commander. And as I walk into the room that I'm led into, the first thing I notice is the borough commander isn't in the room. Actually, the person in the room is a senior chief inspector. And he says to me in a very sullen voice, Jason, I need you to sit down. Straight away, my heart starts beating a million miles an hour um, because I believed I was being led in to get this moment that I've been working to for two years to get my certificate. And he says to me, Jason, um, there's been allegations made against you. And he explained that my ex-partner had made allegations that I had committed um, a crime um, of theft. He alleged that I'd given him um, an ID card for the purposes of getting into bars. Now, I knew absolutely nothing about this. Immediately, I started um, breaking down into tears. And the chief inspector then went on to say to me that you're going to be suspended from this moment um, on full pay, but you're going to be suspended. And honestly, I must have been in the room 45 minutes Tears, 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 tears. I just couldn't believe um, what he'd done to me. It, it, the the threats he'd made to me, he'd followed through on, and it might my, my world was just falling apart. Um, so I ended up going home and cr probably crying for the whole evening. Um, and then the day started to unfold where I was just. Absolutely. Every day that went by, um, fearing about what was going to happen. So about two weeks later, I had had a friend of mine stay over and we were both sleeping in the um, same bed together. And it got to four in the morning and there was an almighty fud at the door. And it really made me jump. I absolutely jumped out of bed. And the fudding continued and I was literally really scared thinking, what on earth? And I opened the door and there's a few police officers there who proceed to tell me that I'm now going to be arrested um, for the allegation of this theft that had been made. And because initially I was suspended, I was now arrested and my poor friend at the time was wondering what on earth was going on. Um, and the police officers told them to leave. Um, my apartment would then proceeded to be um, searched and I was taken to a police station again in an absolute flood of tears. Um, 
and I suddenly found myself on the inside of a custody cell and I was traumatised. So I got interviewed um, about it. I explained uh, everything that I could to the police and then I was told that I was being uh, bailed to return. Now, this period went on with me being on bail for a very long time. I didn't know what to do with every day because in actual fact, um, I didn't have much free money at all. I barely could make ends meet when I was working. So being off every day um, was really, really difficult for me. I also started to become really paranoid that I was being followed um, and I started to believe that basically the police were out to get me because of the fact that I tried to raise some allegations about the sergeant back then. I very much felt, and I still feel to this day, that the police were using um, this criminal case as leverage to try and discredit me in a civil case I was trying to raise for bullying with two other female police officers. So every time I went back for bail, I was told that I was being rebailed. And what I decided to do, um, because I was becoming increasingly paranoid about um, officers following me, and also the fact that I could potentially bump into Daniel at any time because he was only living down the road. I decided one evening to get my mum to move into the apartment, which she very reluctantly agreed to because she saw it as my home. And I told her that I was packing up my bags and I was going to secretly move to Manchester, which for people that don't know Manchester, it's right up north in the country. So one night, about 1am in the morning, um, I make the journey up to Manchester and I move into a house share. So uh, for all intensive purposes, I still let the police believe that I was in London, but I would, every time I had a bail appointment, I would uh, get the train down to London to attend it. So I moved into a house share in Manchester and no one knew anything about the fact that I was a police officer. And... No one knew about my situation and I sort of invented a bit of a different story. And actually, I started to make some friends up there and I started to almost build um, a, a sort of crazy life where, um, I, don't get me wrong, every single day I had extreme anxiety. But the fact that I was kind of living this um, other life, it, it was actually probably... A, a, a distraction that I needed because at least in the times that I was around other people I wasn't having to necessarily live the reality that I was going through so it got to a point where the police made a decision about my um whether to or not to charge me and they made a well the crown prosecution service really rather than the police but it was decided they would charge me so I went to magistrates court and because theft is an either way offence, meaning it, it can be either heard in a Crown Court or a Magistrates Court in this in England, I took one look at the judge in front of me on the, the initial um, hearing and I just got the worst vibe that he was, I just, just felt basically he was a dinosaur and he didn't really seem to, um, I, I also felt there was a slight bit of homophobia with him. So I decided to have the trial um, at a Crown Court. Now, it's a very risky decision because if you decide to get the case heard at Crown Court, Crown Courts can impose a much more serious sentence. And th what I'd been um, told about was they like to make an example out of police officers anyway. Um, so I had to make this decision. Do I want my future um, to be decided by one individual, um, a magistrate, or do I want to have a cross section of society and have my case heard at a Crown Court. So months went on and every time there was a couple of occasions where I was called up on the Friday when I was in Manchester and told that the case would be heard on the Monday, which obviously wasn't ideal. But on two occasions, I was told that actually Daniel was now living in Spain himself and he wasn't willing to come back. So on the third occasion, uh, the uh, I was called on a Friday, told that it would be heard on a Monday, and I immediately came back down to London. Now, the trial was listed for five days um, over this um, alleged theft. And I came back, and as soon as I... Because I went to the court with my mum every day, 
the first day of walking into the court, I'm absolutely hounded by photographers who are there to take my picture and things just keep getting worse and worse. I went through the trial and the the, the most difficult thing about a trial is I was sitting in, in the dock with a security guard next to me and I had I could see every because what happens in a trial is the prosecution puts their case first forward. So the prosecution will lay out the case that bring all their witnesses on. So for the first two, three days of the trial, I didn't even have the ability to say anything. All I had was um, the, all I had was the case against me. And every single time uh, someone would say something in the court or a witness would go up, um, I would be uh, I could see the jury constantly looking at me. And it's an awful feeling. Um, a really, really awful feeling. And the, I, do, I do want to say at this point, false allegations against people is something that I really want to pursue because it has the impact to totally ruins people's life. And I think there's a massive um, problem at the moment in this country about um, false allegations and um, the police not pursuing people for perverting the course of justice. But anyway, that's a conversation for perhaps another time or a different podcast. So... His witnesses were himself and, much to my surprise, his dad. And his dad gave a story which was completely false to paint me in the worst light, which I couldn't believe myself because his dad had known what was going on because he'd even come and seen it himself. So we got to the point where I gave my evidence. Um, I had my mum come up there, bless her, in the witness stand and then we got to the point where the jury were there to make their verdict. And they, the jury went out and they were out for the minimum amount of time, actually. I think it was, I can't remember exactly, but it was an hour. But I can assure you that hour to me felt like um, days um, just sitting there waiting. And my mum, I said to my mum, do you want to come in? And she just, she just couldn't bring herself to go in. So me and a friend went in to get the verdict. She just... She just couldn't bring herself to go in there, um, which is totally understandable. The foreman of the jury stood up and delivered a unanimously not guilty verdict, which honestly, I just, it was such a relief, um, such a relief. I'd had 18 to 24 months of this hell. So we went for a drink, which I can assure you wasn't a celebration. It was more um of it was pure relief and anything i was scared that i was going to go to prison for something i hadn't done so we went for a drink no sooner after being uh, at the pub for maybe half an hour my phone rings and it's um the chief inspector again and he said jason we've heard the result of the court case we now um, require you to be back at work monday which I couldn't believe. No question as to how I was. No question as to the the fact I'd been through this. They wanted me back. Uh, it was Friday, about six o'clock when we was in the pub and they wanted me back Monday morning. So I had to drive straight back to Manchester, pack all of my belongings up that were up there and then race back down to London to attend the police station. So when I got back for the first day, they told me that I was going to be on restricted duties because what the police then intended to do was to use all of the criminal trial um, evidence, which even though I was found not guilty, um, they were going to use it against me potentially in a misconduct hearing. So my job every day was being sat in a room all alone, ringing up uh, victims of crime to ask them about their opinion of the Met Police, which, as I'm sure you could appreciate, that uh, that, that was probably the, the worst place to put me in. And it was really lonely every single day being in a room. This went on for another period of months. And eventually I checked into um, a medical facility for stress for a, for a week's treatment. And um, when I was there, uh, three days into it, which the, the police did know about, they called me up to say, look, um, you're going to now go to a misconduct hearing and um, you basically you've got 30 days until the hearing, uh, which essentially gave me one day to resign because if I didn't um, resign after, uh, what am I trying to get at? If I didn't resign after that period, then I would still be employed at the point of the misconduct hearing. So my advice at the time was don't resign because we don't think you're going to lose your job. But 
in actual fact, the reason I resigned was because I just... The, the thing I was really struggling with as well was even if I was to get found um, to keep my job and go back to my normal duties, that would have placed me back with the sergeants. So uh, against the advice, I decided to resign, but that left me with a, a, a big issue. I need to find another job. And the problem I had was... Um, every time I um, applied for a job, um, I just knew that there would be a big problem when it came to the part of getting a reference. So this is when um, the next chapter of the story comes in and you will start to find out a bit about how I used and rediscovered the law of attraction. So eventually I came to the conclusion that what I needed to do was I needed to move back to Manchester. I started to really fall in love with Manchester, but I'm not sure did I fall more in love with the place or the fact that I'd uh, made some friends up there that sort of totally didn't know about all the ins and the outs of what was going on in my previous life. So I decided to apply for recruitment consultant roles. Now, uh, the roles that were advertised were all at entry level positions, which were on about £18,000, which was effectively about minimum wage back then. And it, it was difficult because I'd gone from a salary where I'd earn um, a lot more than that. And I'd bought a flat and even finances were tight then. And my mum was still living in that apartment. And there was absolutely no way in the world that I wasn't going to meet my mortgage commitments because that would have put my mum homeless. So I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. I had mortgage commitments that I needed to pay and I needed to find a job quickly. And when I say quickly, I mean really quickly. So I got a job at a recruitment agency and I'd managed to get um, a point of contact in the police to do me a character reference. He was one of the people that supported me through the trial. So I started at this recruitment agency and my average day was I'd get into work at 7.30 in the morning. I'd finish at about 6.30 at night. Then as the evening came, I uh, started doing spray tans from um, when I finished work at the recruitment agency to about 10.30 at night. I'd started uh, doing a cash in hand mobile spray tanning, which is a whole nother story in itself. So I was effectively working from the crack of dawn right up until about 11 o'clock at night doing these spray tans just to try and make ends meet. And even then, at that point, I was still coming in on a shortfall every month. So I was getting into more and more debt. Then I started to, I knew that I needed to make money. And it was around that time that the law of attraction just came back into my mind. I'd totally forgotten about it in amongst all of the trauma that I'd gone through. And I picked it back up and I read the book, The Secret, and I really started to practice it. But I was going to become the best recruitment consultant. I didn't just think it. I knew that I needed to feel it. Now, feeling it is very important. And it's something I'm going to talk about at the end of this episode. I didn't just um, have in my mind that I wanted to achieve this. I really got into my mind and felt that I was going to be successful. Now, a lot of these feelings were uh, the feeling, the belief and the feeling that I was going to do whatever it took to absolutely get there. Um, although it was coming from a place of fear and, um, you know, worry because I needed to make it, um, I really did feel that I was going to do whatever needed to be done to make this because at the end of the day, I had to um, make sure that my mum was OK and I had to make sure that I was OK. So about three months into my recruitment journey, um, I started to make money and it literally took off very quickly. I kept in these very good habits of um, making sure that I was trying to look after myself the best I could, making sure that um, I would visualise myself in the place that I wanted to be. I would feel the feelings of gratitude um, for every single deal that came in. And gratitude is a massive part of the law of attraction. And at this juncture of the story, I just want to stop to say that one of the most important things is feeling grateful for what you already have before more can actually materialise. And what most people don't seem to realise about the law of attraction is in order to actually receive, you need to first of all be grateful for what you've got. And that can be re really difficult, actually. If you're in a negative place in your life, if you've in a set of negative circumstances, which 
by me sharing this story, I wanted to um, highlight to you that at that time in my life, I was in a really bad place. I'd got a lot of trauma um, that had happened to me and um, it, it could have been very easy to think negative, but I had to really sort of um, get hold of my thoughts. And actually one book that I read at the time, which I do think really helped was The Chimp Paradox. And The Chimp Paradox talks about um, kind of the monkey on your shoulder. And um, it basically talks about the primitive brain and um, the sort of intelligent part of the brain and how the primitive part of the brain is much larger and can control your thoughts. It's a really good book to read, but I'm going to save um, delving into sort of working with your mind more in another episode. So to carry on with the story, um, I, I ended up making a, a lot of money over a period of a year. It still wasn't necessarily plain sailing, though. My um, ex-partner went on to harass me for years by sending um, anonymous letters to my employers, um, which was just absolutely awful. So to move the story along, I... Uh, worked for a couple of recruitment agencies and then I started my own business and very much at that time um, I was still when I started the business I was using the law of attraction I had to it was a big risk starting the business I'm not going to um, make any illusions otherwise but I really believed and the, the law of attraction at that point it, it's almost become an, a part of me the way that I would think and I'm not going to say it was always easy at times but when it came to my career, I was very, very good at believing in myself, seeing where I wanted to go and feeling the feelings of gratitude for what I had at that time, but also feelings of gratitude for what was coming. I started my own business and it grew pretty quickly, but I fell into a bit of a pitfall a couple of years on into the business because I think I'd just been running and running and running and running um, since the point of leaving the police. And I'd never really stopped to address any of that trauma that I went through. And I ended up um, becoming quite addicted to um, cannabis. Um, and I think that it was because it was a way to chill me out and whatnot. And that led to a whole raft of problems. I ended up also um, suffering from psychosis um, once I started my business, which was absolutely awful lots of people don't know necessarily what psychosis is but and it's, it's actually quite difficult to explain but basically reality was somewhat distorted and it's just a really really scary experience um and it took me many years to recover from that and whilst most people normally take um a period of time off after psychosis um, I literally pretty much worked. I had one week off and then I carried on working again and I made a whole raft of um, really bad business decisions off the back of it. Um, they, what what happened uh, further along in the story was my business then started to do really badly and got to the point of nearly going bankrupt because what I'd actually done was replaced gratitude for worry because the business had got bigger I was struggling to control it I'd never ran a business before and actually by replacing gratitude for worry what what actually happened was the business started doing really badly and then I kind of lost touch with the law of attraction went on this absolute downward spiral where everything I'd built up was hanging in the balance and um, again then I rediscovered the law of attraction and managed to swing the pendulum back the other way now um, I have struggled to explain this story because there's still so much to it. I've given you literally a whistle stop tour and I'm um, in a future episodes, we'll go into more detail about different facets of my story, which I feel can help you. But what I was trying to get across in this story was the essence of how if you're grateful for what you've got, no matter what the circumstances might be, and if your life is not in a great place at the moment, it can be really, really difficult to look for um, things to be grateful for. So moving this along to my advice with the law of attraction, the first step to manifesting the life that you want is to be grateful for what you've got. Now, you might 
like I said before, you might be in negative circumstances. You might not have the best life at the moment, but there is always aspects of your life you can be grateful for, whether it's your health, whether it's food on the table, whether it's the fact you've got a job and income. But I firmly believe if you're not grateful for what you've already got, you will not manifest more into your life. Now, one thing that really helped me, and I know that I've mentioned the secret earlier on in this episode, and the secret is obviously the really well publicized book that really talks about um, the law of attraction. One thing that I struggle with with the secret and is I would do the secret and then I would forget about it. I would remember it, the elements of it. Um, but I would end up forgetting it. And one thing that really helped me was a book called The Magic. And the book called The Magic is basically the sequel to The Law of Attraction. It's again by Rhonda Byrne. And The Magic is a 28-day course where every day you have to do um, an activity. Now, I really liked this book and I liked it for a number of reasons. One, because I think it's manageable. And the essence of the book is... It starts off by giving you the first two days. The first activity you do is you wake up every morning and you write down 10 things you are grateful for. Now, I must admit, I find 10 a bit too many um, because I tend to find when I've got 10, um, I don't feel as grateful for every single one of them as much as I do if I've just put down five. So I think it's important to say with this book that you can sort of adapt it to you. And, you know, if you feel that a certain exercise might work slightly in a better way, don't feel that you have to stick to it absolutely to the letter. And the second thing, the second day's activity in the book, which I still do to this day, is it's called the Gratitude Rock. And I have a rock by my well, I actually have a crystal by my bed. And every night before I go to bed, I hold this um, crystal and I try to think and be grateful for the best thing that's happened to me on that particular day. Now, by virtue of the fact that you're kind of going through all the good things that have happened in your day, you're exuding uh, gratitude, not just for the, the best thing, but for lots of things when you're trying to identify that main thing to be um grateful for i do recommend um the magic because it also has um a part in the book where it says that if you miss a day you have to go back three days now to be honest with you it has taken me a very long time to finish the magic because i tend to find that i get to day 15 or 16 and then i miss a day and and some days i've landed back up on day one um which has actually been a little bit demotivating but what I like about it is it really gives you practices that you can use in everyday scenarios. One practice I really liked, actually, and it, it made me smile, was um, it gives you an exercise where you have to go into work and you have an invisible gratitude assessor following you around all day. And this invisible gratitude assessor is going to keep a list of every time you're thankful for something at work, it's going to write it down. But every time... Um, you come across something that isn't so great, it's going to write it down. Then at the end of the day, the invisible gratitude assessor uh, makes, um, you know, a decision on how grateful you have been. And if you have given more positive thoughts than negative thoughts, um, then you pass. And I actually found it to be a really good activity. It really got me conscious of the amount of times that sometimes I might let little things in the day annoy me and it can send you off on a tangent. Now, the law of attraction is not something that is necessarily easy. If you're someone that um, isn't necessarily a positive thinker or you always see the glass half full rather than um, half empty, or sorry, the other way around, half empty rather than half full. It can be difficult, but you know, if you're going to change your life and actually manifest what you want, then it isn't always going to be easy. You do have to make big changes, and it might be you've got people in your life that are bringing you down and are mood hoovers and are sucking the life out of you. And if you've got those kind of people in your life and they're maybe not conducive to where you want to be, then it might be worth thinking, you know, do I want to keep some distance from some people? I think that the people that we have around us really do mirror where we're going to go in life. And I've actually found myself as I've um, built up my company, it's my company um, uh, as of current day is a national business with um, a multi-million pound turnover. And I I've realised that a lot of the people from the past have kind of dropped away as I've gone along on this journey. So like I said, first step is being um, grateful. Then you need to actually think about what it is that you really want to manifest into your life. 
I really love vision boards. Now, a vision board, I actually have one on my fridge. So every um, few months, I will create a Word document with pictures. I'm very visual. I love pictures. And I will put on there things that I want to manifest. And the reason I love it on the fridge is we all go into the fridge how many times a day. And every time I go on, my fridge is almost like... um, Everything that I'm trying to achieve, everything that I'm trying to manifest, things that I'm trying to keep in my mind, whether it be affirmations, um, they live on the front of my fridge. And that really seems to work well for me. Um, There was a stage where it was on the front door, but I'd be in such a rush in the morning to get out the front door. I wouldn't be stopping to look, be grateful. Um, Normally, when I'm going into the fridge, it's a bit more of a leisurely activity. So vision vision boards work really well. And what I also love about them is it allows you to see that once you've manifested something it's it's really good you can actually see that it's working sometimes what I say to people the biggest thing that I find hard about the law of attraction is um, self-limiting beliefs and I want to talk about these because um, they get in the way for me even um, one of the biggest self-limiting beliefs that I seem to have is because of some of the trauma from uh, that I've had in the past from relationships, I've really struggled to manifest um, uh, someone romantic into my life because I've got these um, traumas and these self-limiting beliefs for one reason or another that it's not going to happen. And a self-limiting belief could be anything from hearing yourself say, I'm not ready, I don't have enough experience, I'm not good enough, um, I don't have time. I can't. I will be judged. And it could be anything. It could be a job, a promotion. But, you know, one thing I've heard a lot through my life is people saying, um, you know, I've missed the boat. And I've heard wannabe entrepreneurs complain that somebody's already built that. Um, somebody's already doing that. But have you ever considered the fact that someone else is making money of something Um, that there's actually evidence that you should start a business and compete with them. I think children display the absolute best of, um, when you look at a child, for instance, they go into the world believing anything is possible. Children don't tend to question in the way that adults do. I think what happens to us as adults is as we go through our life, we get experiences, we get doubt, we get traumas, we get challenges, and we become quite cynical in what's possible and what's not. Children really do live in a state of awe, amazement, all the world around them. And I think by sometimes discovering that inner child within you, you can sort of get to the nitty gritty of some of these self-limiting beliefs. We all have them and self-limiting beliefs are the ones which really have the greatest potential for impacting negatively upon you achieving your full potential. So we do we do develop these limiting beliefs to protect us from future pain. Um, it's a primitive instinct that, you know, we uh, years ago, when we was all um, walking around hundreds of years ago, we, we would have to have this built in, you know, because there might be a saber toothed tiger running at us. There was a story I heard years ago, um, and I can't remember where I heard it from, but I think this kind of describes things really well. Um, it, the story is about a baby elephant that is tied to a fence post. And as the baby elephant tugs and pulls, it fails to break um, the fence or break the rope. And eventually it gives up and makes peace with its fate. The baby elephant is stuck. But eventually the elephant grows up and becomes a big adult elephant with massive legs and a huge tusk and a swirly trunk. And it could easily walk away from the fence if it wanted to. But believing the fence is some sort of a movable thing, the adult elephant (laughs) remains tied to it, believing it can never get away. I think whatever we believe and whatever vibration we send out to the universe becomes our reality. We have known this for a long time. And of course, it was the outlook which prompted Henry Ford's quotation. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I'm a firm believer that you are in the director's seat of your own life and how it unfolds. But it's really down to you, what you believe in and what you put out to the universe will manifest. Limiting beliefs typically come in one of three flavours i found. It's either limiting beliefs about yourself that make you feel like you can't do something because something is inherently wrong with you. 
Number two, limiting beliefs about the world that make you feel you can't do something because no one will let you. Or three, limiting beliefs about life that make you feel you can't do something because it's too difficult. The reason why I'm talking through self-limiting beliefs so much is they are the number one thing that stops people from manifesting. So how to deal with a self-limiting belief? First of all, you need to identify it. That's the first step of overcoming a self-limiting belief is to identify it. Start by paying attention to your inner dialogue. So the chatter in your mind and the thoughts that arise when you consider pursuing a goal or making a change. Look for these kind of red flag ways of thinking. Things such as I'm not good enough. I'll never succeed. I'm too old to start. These are often really good clues that you're dealing with a self-limiting belief. Now, once you've identified these beliefs, what can we start doing to dismantle them? The process of overcoming self-limiting beliefs can be challenging. And I know that because I'm still battling some self-limiting beliefs myself. And sometimes I think I've dealt with one and then it rears its head again. And I start getting those I'm not good enough. I'll not succeed type thoughts in my mind. It really is something that you need to keep working on. So The first step really is awareness. Acknowledge the belief and the impact on your life. I sometimes think writing these down is a really good thing because I keep, for instance, a soul journal and the soul journal really seems to work for me um, in terms of writing my thoughts down and everything such as that. It was actually advice that I was given by a medium friend of mine called Sarah Deverell, who's actually on on the very next episode. So I'm sure she's going to talk all about that. Step number two is the question. Challenge the belief's validity. Is it based on facts or is it based on assumptions? Now, this works really well for me. Sometimes when I'm going down a rabbit hole of worrying or self-limiting beliefs, I will draw literally on my notepad or my soul journal and I will put down facts and then I will put down perhaps assumptions or things that my mind is jumping to and then I will weigh it up am I actually worrying about something that's real right now? Or am I worrying about a hypothetical situation of the future? A lot of these self-limiting beliefs are worries about things that haven't even happened yet. So it's really good to get things down on paper, get your thoughts down on paper to challenge, uh, is the belief that you've got actually valid? Now, step number three is to replace. Replace the negative belief with a positive affirmation. I love positive affirmations and they're something that even I need to start using more often because they really do work. For example, if you believe you're not good enough, tell yourself I'm capable and I'm worthy. If you feel that you're not going to find a partner, perhaps tell yourself I am lovable, I am enough. And sometimes I stand in my um, bedroom in the morning brushing my teeth And I will, and I used to do this actually loads. I forgot to say this earlier on. When I was um, in those early recruitment days trying to build my way, I would stand in front of the mirror and I would say to myself, I'm going to be the best recruitment consultant. I am going to be the best on the London desk. I am going to make loads of money. And actually it would do something in the morning. It would put me into a positive frequency that would really set me up for the day. What I sometimes um, have done in the past that has worked really well for me is I will record um, a series of positive affirmations and I will play them back to myself through headphones. You can use voice memos on your phone. Don't get me wrong, it can be uncomfortable at first to listen back to your own voice, but if it is uncomfortable listening back to your own voice, then ask yourself, why is that? Why would my own voice be uncomfortable to listen to? Remember, this is a journey of self-discovery and at times it is going to make you feel uncomfortable, but um, it's essential to move forward to, to do that. So, affirmations I can't endorse them enough I do think they're really good and if you've got a self-limiting belief um, get an affirmation that really programs your mind against that you can also go onto um, YouTube and there is um, common kind of problems that people have got or self-limiting beliefs that people have got you can actually listen to tracks where it will be a meditation where it will tell you Um, affirmations and you can even make these yourself in time I've made meditations in the past which will um, have nice music on in the background and there'll be affirmations which are telling me the things that I need to work on myself step number four take action act in alignment with your new belief to take small steps towards your goals now 
What does that really mean, take action? Um, one example that springs to mind is supposing that you want to bring a partner into your life and your wardrobe is absolutely overloaded um, with clothes and whatever. Take action to maybe clear out half of the wardrobe, put it out there that someone is going to come into your life. Um, it might be that you've got an idea about a business. Take action, start doing things that are aligning with where you want to be. And number five is seek support. Um, if you really are struggling with a self-limiting belief, then there is a range of therapies out there. I've tried CBT myself, which is compulsive behavioral therapy, because I had um, general anxiety disorder, um, commonly known as GAD. Very nice. It sounds like a um, car park, doesn't it? But what what CBT does is, and it's it's a really good therapy, it goes on over about a period of six months, and it works on what is the root of the anxiety or um, the belief that you have? And what it sort of goes through a process of what I remember of the, of the therapy. And one thing that really stuck with me is when I have a worry that comes into my mind, the first thing that I do when I have a worry or an anxiety is I ask myself a question. I say to myself, is this something that's happening right now? Is this a real worry or am I worrying about something that in the future that hasn't even happened yet? And what I've tended to find is most um, worries or anxieties are about the future. They're about this could happen or this could happen or this could happen. It's about things that haven't even happened yet. So I kind of go down um, and actually one thing I use is a worry tree. Um, so the first thing I'll do when I have a worry is I'll ask myself, is it real or is it hypothetical? If it's not real and it's hypothetical, then quite simply... I will um, do something that distracts me to take me away from that worry. Now, uh, it does take time. When you Sometimes you can get thoughts which are so overpowering that you can't not pay attention to them. And trust me, I do at times still have them now. I'll go down a rabbit hole where my mind is controlling me and I'm not controlling my mind. But really good things that can stop you from um, going down these rabbit holes is activities like Sudoku, crosswords, uh, things that make your brain engage. It's impossible, for instance, to do Sudoku or a crossword and to still be thinking about a worry because your brain doesn't allow you to do those two things. And music is another really good one as well. So if it, when I go down the worry tree, if the problem is a real problem, the first question I ask myself, does it need my immediate attention right now? If it doesn't require my immediate attention in the present moment, I will then schedule to deal with it another time and again, divert my attention. If it needs attention right then, I will give it attention right then. But this is about trying to take control of your thoughts, let you control your mind and not let your mind control you. When it comes to the law of attraction, sometimes I think when you're first starting out on the journey, it's good to focus on small things because if you're thinking about, right, I want to um, go and have £50,000 land in my bank account tomorrow, you'll have in the back of your mind that that's not really likely or possible. And that alone is enough to stop you manifesting it. A typical example could be you could picture in your mind that you're going to have a certain type of feather uh, land in your hand. It's much more easier for you to believe that that's possible than to start off with big things. So what I would say, if you're on the beginning of this journey, start small, start with something that maybe seems likely that you could get behind, that you could fully believe in, because that's the first key. I think when you're first starting out and, you, and you're perhaps dubious, of course we're dubious, you know, when we first start out with this and someone says you can get whatever you want in life and that's possible, um, you, you will be dubious. Of course you will, because we live in um, a world um, that is sometimes very cynical. So start with something small, I would say, and then go from there. And once you've seen that it works, then start to think big. Now, the last piece of advice I want to give you when it comes to the law of attraction is about feeling. Feeling is like literally supercharging this process. You need to engage all of your five senses. So I'm going to talk about what I mean with that. When you engage all of your five senses in your manifestation process, it deepens the connection between your desires and your subconscious mind. When you activate your senses, you create a more vivid and immersive experience in your mind. And this sends a truly powerful signal to your subconscious that what you desire is not just a distant dream, but it's actually a tangible reality. 
So let me give you an example of how this sensory engagement actually works in practice. So let's say you want to manifest a dream vacation to a tropical paradise. So close your eyes and imagine yourself on a white sandy beach. Feel the warm sun on your skin, the soft sand between your toes. Hear the gentle rustle of the palm leaves in the breeze. Taste the salty ocean air and even smell the tropical flowers nearby. Engaging all of your senses in this way makes your visualization more real and compelling to your subconscious. So when you create these multi-sensory experiences in your mind, it really does boost and help the process. And I know that works because I do it myself all the time. And back to the beginning of this story, that's really what I did when I was in those days of wanting that job a virgin. So so there we go. I really hope my story has helped you because what I want you to take from this is if you're in a bad place in your life at the moment and things aren't going well, it is possible to turn the pendulum the other way and to manifest the life that you want. And I know that better than anyone. I've gone from a place where, as you've heard in the story, I was at rock bottom to building up um, a big company. So I really hope my advice helps. And as I said earlier, I really think a good place to start is by uh, if you're someone that wants to work through this is by getting a copy of the magic it really helped me and every time I feel like I'm going a bit wonky with the law of attraction it's always where I go back to first of all now in the next episode of Soul Seek, we're going to be joined by Sarah Deverell now Sarah's a good friend of mine and she is an excellent teacher she's also someone that's really helped me on my spiritual journey so you're in for a real treat there Sarah's also going to be taking us on a guided meditation to help us sit in the power She'll explain all about what that is in the next episode. She's a spiritual medium, a Reiki master healer and teacher. And Sarah's life really is an intricate tapestry woven with transformative experiences, daily meditative practices and an unwavering commitment to spiritual development. She's had 15 years of being on a quest following her calling to work in the spiritual world. Now, she's not just a passive observer. She is a dedicated seeker and she's also been trained by some of the world's very best mediums. Sarah's story really is a symphony of spirit, a tale of growth, connection and profound experiences. So I look forward to her joining us on the next episode. A big thank you for joining me on another enlightening episode of Soul Sync. For more spiritual insights, free meditation downloads, my thoughts, also my personal book recommendations, and of course, the latest updates about SoulSync, subscribe to my newsletter at jasonpaulmedium.com. Just head straight to the bottom of the page and sign up to stay connected with the soulful community I'm building. If you have suggestions for a future episode or a guest you'd love to see featured, or if you have a story you'd like to share with our wonderful audience, simply email me at hello at jasonpaulmedium.com. Your stories and ideas really are the heartbeat of SoulSync and your input is invaluable in shaping the soulful conversations we bring to you. I'm Jason Paul. This is the SoulSync. Until next time, goodbye.